Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. Here we're in our second video looking at unemployment. What we're going to get into in this video <clears throat> in specific is taking a look at determinants, things that are going to affect our unemployment rate in the short run versus long run fluctuations in unemployment rate. So by separating these two, short run versus long run unemployment, we kind of get an insight as to what changes unemployment in our short run in our month to month kind of view versus our long term or in our year to year over the course of a decade or so right and again i've been just picking decade off the top of my mind this can be over the course of even just a few years influencing our unemployment rate that is just our shorter term influencers versus our longer term influencers what we're going to wrap up with for this video is taking a look at our relationships between long-term, short-term unemployment, and how unemployment and GDP are intricately linked together. So we'll wrap up with some really key concepts, some really key relationships. These key relationships, of course, being something that will haunt you for the rest of this course. And I say that, but I joke. It's They will, they will carry forward with us, but they really are not that bad. So let's carry on taking a look at unemployment, and let's go jump over and look at what we have. Let's talk about some of our changes in unemployment rate. We saw that they moved around a lot as we went through time. Let's talk about why that is. What caused that? What's going on in, in that sense, really? So really the way we can think about this, and let's kind of label this, we're going to take a look at our changes in short run unemployment or short term unemployment might be the better way to say that. And the way that we can really model this and take a look at this is really going back to our supply and demand diagram. We can take a look at wages. We can take a look at our quantity of labor. And we can go, okay, here's my demand for labor. And then upward sloping, there's my supply of labor. At that intersection point there, well, we end up getting our market wage and our quantity exchanged. How many workers or how many hours are being worked all together? I'll call that W0 for wage naught and Q0 for our initial quantity exchanged. Okay, now let's suppose that all of a sudden we have a drop in real GDP. That is, we have some economic crisis, we have something that's happened that has caused a decrease in our output, right? Keep in mind, that's what real GDP is. It's measurement of our real output, how much stuff we're able to produce. And on the other side, output, expenditure, income. So all together, the amount of output is dropping. Hey, if we have a drop in output, that's also less, the reason often is that's a less demand for goods and services. That is, we don't need to produce as much stuff, right? So that, that is less stuff being produced. That's what we mean by, hey, a drop in real GDP, fewer things, that's less stuff produced. Well, if we're not producing as much stuff, do we really have the same demand for as many people? That is, why am I paying all these workers if I'm not having them produce as much stuff? So, hey, less stuff produced, we can say, therefore, less demand for workers, right? Less demand for workers. That means, hey, oh, that's a funny kind of looking key. That means my demand curve is going to be shifting to the left. So, okay, we do that. What exactly happens as my demand curve shifts to the left? Let's just kind of do one of these. So there we go, there's my demand curve shifting to the left. Let's just get rid of this little bit that sticks out. What do I have? Well, at this initial wage, I had my initial quantity exchanged, which is now just my quantity supplied. Wage to supply down is my quantity supplied. And then I have from my initial demand down, I have, hey, at this wage rate, I'm going to have the corresponding quantity demanded. 
That is, we'll notice between these two, this is the lower of the two, the minimum of quantity supplied and quantity demanded is my quantity exchanged. So that guy, that's my quantity exchanged. The difference between these two, all of these people are willing to supply hours. We only want to pay people for that many hours. This is our unemployment. And specifically, what we would call this, we would call this cyclical unemployment. And that is, it is unemployment caused by or due to the cycles in real GDP. And right, we already talked about this idea of the business cycle, that real GDP expands, it contracts, it kind of goes around this idea of potential GDP. We introduced that concept as a general idea, said keep it kind of in your back pocket for now. Yeah, we're not going to fully go into it yet, but we're going to talk about it again shortly. So this idea of cyclical unemployment is the effect of, okay, we have unemployment due to this drop in GDP. But is this really long lasting, right? We took a look at, we talked about our adjustment equilibrium and we said, okay, hey, look at this. We have this excess supply of labor. People would want to be working rather than be un unemployed. So they began to offer their labor for lower and lower wages. Wages fall and we eventually make our way back to equilibrium. And then, hey, we'd have no more unemployment. We just had people dropping out of the labor force, essentially. But, okay, we actually don't witness that happening. What we actually witness happening quite regularly is a phenomenon known as sticky wages. And really, I should say downward sticky wages. That is, we don't fight a wage increase, but we do notice that workers do fight a wage decrease. So what we would say is that wages are downward sticky. They may eventually fall and may eventually work their way back to the new equilibrium, but this isn't going to be a fast process. This will be a slow painful process with lots of fighting along the way. And there's a lot of theories that kind of explain why we would expect this downward wage stickiness. Many of them are fairly common sense if you think about it, you as an employee, but we can kind of give them a name and talk about them just briefly to kind of address some of the main theories out there. In no way is this an exhaustive list, right? So first kind of idea, first kind of theory would be along the idea of this adverse selection. So adverse selection really just meaning, hey, we decide to cut our wages. That is, as a firm, we just say, no, hey, guys, we're going to just push down wages. We're just going to force them down because, hey, it's our company. We run it. We're just going to push these down. We're going to have fewer of you. Hey, we're actually going to have more than we would have at this bit, but we're going to pay you all less. Well, why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't the firm just force this into effect? Why do they keep paying their workers more than they would want, right, way up here, and have fewer workers than they would want, QD rather than this new equilibrium? Well, the idea being is that if you force the wage lower, if you said, okay, no, we're going to have this lower wage, we're just, boom, implementing it, well, not all your workers are the same level of skill. Not all your workers are the same level of productivity. Some of your employees are really good. Some of your employees are honestly probably more productive, giving you more gain than you're paying them. Other employees, well, they're breathing. So they're there, right? And uh, you need them. They're, right? You need a body to fill the role, but they're not necessarily the most productive. If you could, you'd want to get rid of those less productive employees, right? But here's the problem. If you just dictated a drop in wages, which employees are going to walk out on you? Which employees are going to say, you know what? I can find a job somewhere else. Well, the employees that are going to walk out on you, the employees that are going to go find a job somewhere else are the employees that know that they are high quality employees. They're the ones that know, hey, even though we're in a downturn, I'm a good worker, I can find a job. So that is by just implementing this drop in wages, you might accidentally choose only the bad workers to remain. You might kick out all your good workers. And as a business owner, that's problematic, right? You don't want that to happen. So 
first kind of problem as to why we have this downward wage stickiness, as to why firms don't just dictate this drop in wages. Well, it's because they don't want to lose all their good workers. Second one is, it's kind of along the same lines actually, just expressed in a different way, is this idea of an insider-outsider model. And the idea being is that any company, any firm, any business has insiders and outsiders. So the insiders being the established workers who have been there for a while, they've learned the job really, really well. They know how to do it excellently. They're very productive and they can train new people. They understand the corporate culture. They understand how things work. They're inside, right? They're part of it. These, these guys you need in order for the company to run smoothly. The outsiders, well, they're the ones who are not yet hired, right? They're the ones looking for work maybe, or they're the more recently hired. They haven't quite yet been part of this group, part of this corporate culture. They haven't quite found their stride in the business yet. The problem is, is that if you start dictating or asking people to take lower wages or pushing wage cuts, well, you risk kind of alienating these insiders, right? Kind of very similar to this adverse selection. You end up pushing out your good workers. Same kind of idea. You end up alienating or pushing out these insiders, these good workers who know the company really well. And by pushing them out, all you're left with then are these new hires, which were willing to accept lower wages, but they're outsiders. They don't know the company. They don't know how to be fully productive yet. They don't know the ins and outs of all the rules and regulations and different tips and tricks in production. So ah, you need to be careful, right? You don't want to push these insiders out. Sure, you might be able to get away with a lower wage, but your loss of productivity could be even greater. That's, that's a problem. Okay, last one we'll take a look at. And by no means, right? And no means is this a collect, um, an exhaustive list. So last one is relative wage coordination. And we'll actually kind of take a look at an idea with this as we move on into our next video as well, when we talk about inflation. But the idea with relative wage coordination is that, hey, you wouldn't actually mind a wage cut if everybody in the country was receiving the same wage cut. That is, if everybody, everybody experienced a 5% decrease in their wages, well, you'd be kind of okay with that because your position relative to all your peers has not changed. Everybody has witnessed this 5% cut in wages. And sorry, that was supposed to be a W. That looks terrible. Let's try that again. 5% cut in wages. There we go. That's a bit better. So the idea there being, because your relative income in relation to all your peers remains the same, it might not be the best, but you'd be okay with it. The problem is, in a decentralized economy like we have in the developed world, you can't actually have this. You have independent firms, independent businesses everywhere. You cannot coordinate this decrease of 5% by everybody. And as a result, hey, if we say 5% in this business, but no one else puts down a 5% wage cut, well, the workers in that business that are experiencing this cut, they're going to fight it. And they will fight that wage cut tooth and nail the best that they can. Mind you, a lot of them might just end up unemployed, but they will fight, they will resist this wage cut. Essentially, all of this just again re-illustrating the fact that this drop in wages is extremely sticky, that we would have this downward wage stickiness, that these workers are going to resist this drop in their nominal wage. Right? They don't want to witness that. They're fighting it. They don't want to see it. Okay. That's not to say it won't happen, right? It's not to say that eventually we won't end up at our new equilibrium of wage one, and then, hey, at wage one, we have supply equals demand. Going back down, we'd have our new quantity exchange and equilibrium, QX, or we can call that quantity one for our new equilibrium quantity exchanged, right? We will get there eventually if we have this sustained pressure of decreased drop in output. But given this downward wage stickiness, it will take a while. And this friction, this friction plays into the economy on home, and it's going to be a really fundamental building block 
as we move forward to explain our business cycle, as we explain recovery and everything really as we move forward. So wage stickiness, pretty big deal. This friction here is friction playing a big kind of key component of a lot when we move forward. So this is definitely a topic, definitely a topic to kind of put a little star on in your notebook to say this is something we will be coming back to. This idea of wage state, ah, this idea of downward sticky wages. So a little bit, a little bit of uh, foreshadowing there, if I will. Okay, what about in the long run though? So we took a look at this. This was our short run changes in unemployment or our short term changes in unemployment. And we said, hey, that was due to changes in real output, real GDP. And this was cyclical, right? As GDP went up, right? We could have the opposite case. If GDP all of a sudden went up, well, hey, we would want to produce more stuff. If we're producing more stuff, we would need more people. So, hey, in that case there, boom, our demand shifts all the way to the right. Well, in this case here, we don't have upward wage stickiness. People are just fine accepting a higher wage. So in accepting a higher wage, we would fairly rapidly adjust from our initial equilibrium there at W naught, Q naught. We would rapidly adjust up and we would end up at our new, and I'll call this one here, I guess, wage two and Q2. So bit of adjustment asymmetry happening there. We would expect a slow downward adjustment and a rapid or relatively rapid upward adjustment there. So that's what we mean by our cyclical unemployment and the effects, right? It's unemployment due to the cycles, the business cycles of our economy. Let's take a look at more long-term unemployment. Changes in long-term unemployment. And what exactly causes these? Well, ultimately our long-term unemployment, we are gonna to refer to this as our natural rate of unemployment. And again, this is going to be a key term. This is again going to be something, this natural rate of unemployment, you're going to want to put stars beside this. This is something that will haunt you for the rest of the course. And I say that rather foreboding. It's not that difficult of a concept. It's just something that we will be carrying forward with us. So what exactly do we mean by this natural rate of unemployment? Well, we can break it apart into two subcategories. The first subcategory we can take a look at is what we will call frictional unemployment. Uh, sorry, not frictional employment. I got that backwards. Frictional unemployment. There we go. And what do we mean by this? Well, even in a perfectly healthy and a really functioning economy, that is, we're not in this decreasing output, so we are laying people off or have high unemployment. No, no, no. Even if the economy was booming, right? Even if it was the case that, hey, there was jobs aplenty. Well, if you quit your job, if you got laid off, if you were just graduating school and looking for work, there is a time, there is a search for you to move and for you to find that job for you. That is, right, you could imagine there is that boss that has a job that you are the perfect you are the perfect fit for, right? This is the boss. We can put top hat. He's the capitalist. He has a job, and here is the empty hole that you would be the perfect fit for. But there's there's a problem, right? And that problem being, this boss needs to go through the whole interview process. Needs to go and find all of, go through, sort through all of their candidates and figure out, hey, which one's the best fit for the job. And then there's you over here, who's a perfect fit for this job, but you don't quite know that yet either. There's all of these other jobs out there that you're also applying for. So in this whole process of you looking for jobs and you trying to find that perfect fit, this all takes time. And during this search time, during all of this, you're unemployed. In the sense here, this is a this is a healthy unemployment. This is not just you taking the first job that's available that you would hate, that you would dread. 
This is you going through your due diligence to find a job that you're going to be a good fit for. This is the employer going through their due diligence and finding somebody who's a good fit for them. In the sense here that due diligence on both sides takes time. It ensures good productivity once that job is found on both parts. But that time, that search, well, that results in a period of unemployment, which we would refer to as this frictional unemployment. Okay. On the other hand, our second part of this natural rate of unemployment is going to be what we would know, uh, what we would call structural, structural unemployment. And in the case of structural unemployment, again, there's you looking for work. And again, here is the capitalist who has a job. That is, it's not that there's no jobs available. There is a job, and there's a job that would be for you. The problem is, the problem in this case is that you don't have the skills. You don't have the skills. You don't have the education. You don't have what is needed to really fit into this job. If you go to school, if you get the skills, if you have the experience perhaps, well, then there's this job waiting for you. And honestly, here in BC right now, with our massive expansion of natural gas pipelines up in the north, with our massive construction boom, this is the case in our trades in today's day and age, is that a lot of the trades, I shouldn't say all of them, but in a lot of the trades, there's this situation where there's jobs waiting to be filled, that there's shortages. We don't have enough people to fill them. If you had that education, if you had that training, if you had that skill set, you could walk into these certain jobs. But of course, they're not the right fit for everybody, right? Not everybody is like, yeah, that's the job I want. And that's the problem. As we talked about in previous videos, when we talked about economic growth, we said, hey, a growing economy is a changing economy. Well, in that sense there, as the economy grows, as the economy changes, so does the skills you need to be relevant. That is, the faster the economy is growing, the more we have this change, well, we typically witness these higher levels of structural unemployment because there's going to be a greater and greater mismatch between the skills needed by employers and the skills had by employees. That mismatch being met through retraining, through re-education, through reacquiring of skill sets. Again, to go back to the inequality from that, typically it's found those individuals who already have post-secondary education, post-secondary training, they are more willing or they are more easily able to retrain, to reskill as changes appear versus those people who didn't have that initial training to start with. So is that partly due to just they already have that, so it's only that additional course they need to get that retraining, that recertification, or is it because they were already somebody who was just more inclined to being retrained, to being reskilled, to fitting into kind of our educational framework, right? A lot of debate, a lot of questions as to really how that fits. But the idea being is that these two types – these two types of unemployment, they will always exist within an economy, and they're, they're natural. They're healthy. That is, we would expect them to be relatively constant through any short-term period of time. We may expect them to change over the long term. That is, if we have fundamental changes in the skill sets we need, well, sure, we might see a spike in structural unemployment. If we put in really generous unemployment benefits – well, that might allow for longer search times, which may give a boost to frictional unemployment. That is, increase frictional unemployment. More people fitting into this category. But where our cyclical unemployment rate kind of, right, has a lot of little spikes and drops as it goes through, our natural unemployment rate, our natural unemployment rate would be more smooth. It would, it will change over our long run but it won't have these short run spikes and drops and ups and downs, ebbs and flows as we move through the seasons, as we move through the cycles. So again, a bit of a difference there between our cyclical and our natural rate of unemployment. And so natural rate, I'll use that as U star, and our cyclical unemployment rate, 
I'll use that as just U. Well, I guess that would be not just our cyclical, that'd be our unemployment rate. So cyclical and natural together. All right, so cyclical, frictional, and structural all together give us our unemployment rate. Which, right, as we saw here in Canada, as of right now, what was that sitting at? That was sitting at something like 8% altogether. 8.8%. Right, which honestly, given right now, that 8.8%, that's likely higher than our natural. Okay, our last thing to take a look at is just a bit of a relationship situation. That is, hey, when we have what we would call our natural rate of unemployment. Oh, that's not how you spell unemployment. Unemployment. So when we observe that, that is, hey, when this is observed, we would say that cyclical unemployment is equal to zero. That is, you can imagine our labor market clears. We're actually at a wage such that labor supply equals labor demand. There's no excess unemployment happening there. We're just right at equilibrium. So, okay. If we're at our natural rate of unemployment, we just have structural, we just have frictional, there's no cyclical unemployment. Well, at this point, we would also say that we have full employment. And this, this is a term that catches up many students, many in the media, right? Many critiques that I end up reading about macro come back to this whole concept of full employment where they go, oh, these economists are presuming we have 100% employment, that everybody's working. Well, no, that's not the case. That's not the case. All that is is just that we don't have any cyclical unemployment. All that there is is this natural, natural unemployment, the structural and the frictional. Then what we do is we take this idea of full employment and we say, okay, if our economy was at full employment, if we were at full employment, well, if everybody who was working with a cyclical at zero, if they were all working, what would be our level of output? And going through that whole thought exercise, and really it's more of a thought exercise, it's more of a big statistical model, we come up with an idea of our potential GDP. So that is the whole idea of our potential GDP is we say, okay, what's our natural rate of unemployment? Cyclical is zero. Everybody who wants to work is working. The only people unemployed are either because they don't have the skills or because they're in the process of finding that job. That natural rate of unemployment, that's our full employment. If all those people were there, how much could they produce? That's our potential GDP. And what we'll do is we'll introduce a notation here where, hey, we called this natural rate of unemployment, you start. We can call potential GDP, we can call this Y star. And typically GDP, GDP, right, we said this is income. Well, another synonym for income, well, expenditure output, what we typically utilize to denote income in economics is Y. So that being said, what do we have so far? U star. That's our natural rate of unemployment. U is just our actual unemployment. So, hey, this would be as we actually measure it, as we actually witness it. Hey, what would we say in Canada? It was 8.8%. Natural rate of unemployment. This is an idea. It is an estimate. Truthfully, that's an estimate too, but this is an even rougher estimate, right? We have to really guess, okay, how much unemployment is due to frictional reasons, how much is due to structural reasons. Very similarly, what we have is we would have our Y star, which is potential GDP, right? Again, potential GDP is based off of the amount of output at our natural rate of unemployment. This again is an idea. It is an estimate. We think this is how much we could produce if we were at full employment. We would want to compare this to 
y, which we would then call our actual GDP, right? And again, actual unemployment, we measure this monthly, right? We said here in Canada in December, that was 8.8%. Actual GDP, again, we measure this about quarterly. And again, we get an actual measurement. I think that was something like $2.08 trillion at our last estimate. So as we go through this, actual GDP, Y, actual unemployment, U. The stars denoting, hey, this idea of natural unemployment, this idea of potential GDP, but just ideas. These are not observable. They are not measurable on their own. What we end up witnessing then, as we go through, as we look at this, when we already took a look at this with our business cycle. In a previous video, when we looked at economic growth, we said, okay, if we were to look at real GDP, so here it's already real GDP, I'm just going to go real Y. We said, hey, Y was our denotion for actual GDP. So if we looked at GDP over time, we said that, hey, it kind of went something like this. Kind of had its business cycle as it made its way up. We then kind of drew in this kind of line here. And we said, hey, look at that. We'll call this line our potential output, how much we could potentially produce at full employment at our natural rate of unemployment. And we're going to compare that to our actual measurement of why our actual GDP. And then we went through and we said, hey, look at this. If actual GDP, right, at that point there, actual GDP was less than potential, right, white below the green, hey, same thing over here, actual below potential, actual below potential, we said in these cases here we had a recessionary output gap. And, and let's just think about that for a second, okay? So, hey, our actual GDP is below our potential GDP. That is the actual amount of stuff we're producing is less than the stuff we would be producing at full employment. So, hey, wait a minute. If we're producing less stuff, do we need as many people? No, 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 we don't need as many people. So if GDP is below this potential GDP, well, then we would expect to witness that our unemployment rate, again, actual unemployment rate, would be above our natural rate of unemployment. And what causes this to go above that? Well, that is we have this spike in our cyclical unemployment, right? That's the kind of situation we looked at. We had these sticky wages. And so we had this cyclical unemployment such that unemployment was higher than our potential. But we have the other scenario as well. We have cases where our actual GDP was above our potential GDP. Right? In these cases here, Y above Y star. What's going on there? Well, let's just scroll down to make some room here. In those cases, we would say we have an inflationary output gap such that our, oh, that was a funny Y, such that our actual GDP is greater than our potential GDP. So, hey, we're producing more stuff than we could at full employment? Wait, how do we produce more stuff than we could if everybody was employed? Well, keep in mind, full employment does not mean everybody's working. Full employment means everybody, we're at our natural unemployment. That is the only people not working are those because they don't have the skills or because they're just waiting to find that perfect job. How do we produce more? Well, we produce more because we start taking people who don't have the skills. We begin taking, we hire people even though it's not the right job. That is, we start to eat into that natural rate. We start to say, yeah, okay, you don't have the skills to be an electrician. We'll train you on the job. You don't have the skills to be a pipe fitter. We'll train you on the job. Right now, the economy is so he superheated. We can sell stuff so quickly and make money. You might not be the most productive. You might not be the best fit. 
I can still use you, you're a body, you're breathing. So in this case here, as output exceeds potential, our blue areas, our inflationary output gaps, well, our unemployment rate would actually be lower than our natural rate of unemployment. And in that way there, our unemployment rate, how is that lower? Again, because we are eating into that sick, or sorry, eating into that natural rate. Yeah, we're hiring people who aren't the right fit. We're eating into that frictional unemployment. We're hiring people even though they don't have the skills. We're eating into that structural unemployment, right? They're not the best fits. They're not the most productive. We're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, as it were. But money is to be made, and all we need is bodies to fill positions. And that's the idea here in this inflationary output gap. So, okay. What have we covered as we've gone through this? We've taken a look at unemployment. We've defined what unemployment is, right? Number of unemployed over the labor force. We said, hey, our labor force was everybody who's employed and unemployed. That is 15 years of age and older and actively working or looking for work. That was our labor force. From there, we then looked at other metrics, participation rate, employment rates. From that, we then went on and we took a look at a few actual cases here in Canada. Looked at a bit of you know history as to what our employment rate, unemployment rate rather, has done, and differences between education levels, gender, etc. We then took a look at our cyclical unemployment. Uh, big thing there is we talked about our sticky wages. We then moved into our long run trends of unemployment. Talked about our natural unemployment, and then the big thing here. Okay, we introduced rather reintroduced potential GDP. We introduced natural unemployment, and then the big link, big link, and this is something, this is something that really will haunt us for the rest of the semester, is this link between recessionary and inflationary output gaps, output versus potential, unemployment versus the natural, right? So a big thing, this is a big star to put beside, to put beside this term here. So... A lot of introduction of terms here, a lot of introduction of stuff happening. This really is big things that will carry forward with us as we carry on through our semester. Okay, that does us for our video on unemployment. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to comment below, post to the frequently asked questions, or feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. Until next time.